And, um, and I imagine that, that the prohibition of cannabis, the prohibition of psychedelics, you know, is just a kind of rejection of our history as a species and our long-term use of these substances for medicinal as well as for, you know, connecting to the divine. And so it's, it's both frightening and also an encouraging time to be in because I think that the research you're doing and your wife is doing is a part of what has been called the psychedelic renaissance. So we're seeing again this resurgence of interest in psychedelics. There's being, like you mentioned, Rick Doblin and, and MAPS uh, and how they're doing their research into MDMA for therapeutic use. And, and the other various experiments that like John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University, they did their research into psilocybin. And I mean, the, the findings, what they're finding over and over again is, is the very positive and um, I mean, just the, the, the amazing impact that a psychedelic can have on a person's consciousness and their long and, and, and their life, their long term view on life. And, uh, and I think that part of the psychedelic renaissance is this reevaluation of our religious history and, and sort of recognizing that this has been a part of our religious origins as a, like uh, the, the, the origins of religion for th- this is a big part of our history as a species and we keep on ignoring it and keep on suppressing it and i think that regardless of how much propaganda they throw at us and and how they keep on throwing people in jail for for consuming these plants and consuming these these drugs you know people are going to continue to want to expand their consciousness and and learn more about themselves and their connection to this divinity right and and i just want to say that you that the work you're doing is a big part of that i think I think a lot of people tend to flock to the work of of maps or or other researchers that are thinking are like doing research with LSD, for instance, on how it affects with, you know, addiction or alcoholism or whatever. And that's very important. Right. That's important. That's a very important part of it. But again, your work is very important, too, because it puts it all in context. It puts it all in perspective. Like, oh, this has been a long journey and we're finally coming back home so to speak and you know there's a lot of battles that need to be fought for lack of a better term i don't know b- battle implies like violence but there's i mean there really is a lot at stake because if you have someone like say jeff sessions as our attorney general and he's like i want to bring back the war on drugs i want to reinstate all these stupid laws and this ridiculous propaganda campaign you know and he's still living in this time where he you know he thinks that that worked he thinks that that was helping of course it wasn't But, you know, he's in that mentality. So if that's still the kind of people that we have in our government institutions and government agencies, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think that, again, your research is playing a part in in this revival of of interest in psychedelics and putting psychedelics in the proper context and uh, as far as human history and and religious history. So I thank you for that. I appreciate your work. Oh, thank you so much. And and it's always wonderful to hear and, and you know, why it's the ultimate validation, you know, that, that there are intelligent people uh, who are looking at this issue and who think that you know, when they think your work is, is a part of the uh, equation, it makes it all worthwhile. And I thank you mm, so much. Absolutely. For those comments. I think you've put this in a very uh, important context. Uh, one of the two of the biggest mistakes, I think, that that Leary and his associates made uh, back in the 60s was one uh, looking at LSD as a new discovery and not really linking it to this vast uh, archaeological and ethnographic and religious history and how integral it's been uh, as a part of shamanism, uh, which was the religion of our hunting and gathering ancestors for 95 percent of human history. And then mm-hmm. the other side over promising this and over promising what the results would be. And in the political cyclotron of the 1960s with the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the hippie movement, this all got caught up and led to Nixon condemning Leary as the most dangerous man in America. And given mm-hmm. what our world's become today, uh, you know, it's almost like a wistful nostalgia. If only know, there was know, right? the biggest problem in the world today, yeah. uh, a lot better off. Um, but nevertheless, as you point out, psychedelics are powerful substances. 
They have caused both religious and political, and in ancient times, these were pretty much one and the same, problems for communities throughout history. They're banned, um, in, you know, they're, they're, uh, banned in the Garden of Eden or they're suppressed in the Garden of Eden as the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're condemned as the instruments of Satan at the time of the Inquisition, and they're prohibited. They're banned under the Controlled Substance Act of 1970s. Now, think about it. How often does a society actually ban research into something? This is, mm-hmm. this is quite monumental. And you're absolutely right. Fortunately, we are in the midst of what I believe is now an unstoppable psychedelic renaissance, and it's brought about uh, by certainly Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University, who's got over 300 peer-reviewed papers, publications, who lifted the veil and got approval for research on psychedelics with human subjects, because that's what was completely prohibited for, for nearly 30 years. The findings that Griffiths um, is is uh, and success they're having with administering psych- uh, psilocybin to terminal cancer patients and it's relieving anxiety and depression in like over about eighty to eighty five percent of the cases in one or two sessions. This right. is remarkable. Uh, it's remarkable because of its speed, of its efficiency. And what it does to the person who's facing death. And Griffith says in, in one of his many interviews that when you see a person who's been so beaten down by a disease, after one or two sessions, gets enough um, vitality back to start comforting his own caregivers and telling them that everything is perfect, that everything is going to be all right. Even we researchers have to mm. stand back in awe. 